Dragon's lecture. Hi, Dragon. Hi, Rogério. I think um, you need to make uh, Dragon a co-host again. There you go. So Dragon, the, the, the class hasn't even started. You already have a question. So <laughs> uh, I think it's by Raul. Raul, turn on your mic and ask question if you want. No problem. Uh, OK. Um, I was wondering if uh, Python has some uh, package for a, a symbolic tensor calculus. Uh, if you if you want to perform some uh, Covariant derivative, um, all the crazy stuff in GR. If I can use some Python routine or or what? I can <laughs> I can honestly say it all. I don't know anything about it. Mm. Okay. Sounds like a good question for the community. Just watch the <laughs> chat here. You already have some answers. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, uh, because there is a exact in Mathematica, but uh, it's, it's a little bit clunky. So, okay, <clears throat> thanks. There are Python packages for everything, amazing. So Dragon, uh, feel free to start any time that you want. You want to start right now? Okay, or thank you. you. Yes, I think I can minutes. start. Thank you, Raul. I can start. Uh, I hope you can see my slides and hear me. I will assume that's the case. Hi, everyone. Uh, today, I will not have any numerical code. So it's going to be a little bit less scatterbrained or uh, yesterday was a bit hectic. I was typing code and I couldn't see my own solution. So I <laughs> had to actually do it on the spot but it was fun. Uh, and today I want to cover two topics. I want to give about 20 minutes to gravitational lensing. Don't do too much, just the very basics. And then I'll spend about 40 minutes on statistical methods in cosmology, give an overview and go from easy to not so easy. And it's all very useful. This is why I want to cover statistical methods. This is maybe arguably the most useful part to learn about stat methods. I think most of you will know the basics here. I think not all of you for sure will know the more advanced material I will cover. Uh, let me cover lensing first. Gravitational lensing is bending of light by gravity. You know, matter curves, space, as you know, and here's a baby picture. But here's an interesting picture why you get lensing. Uh, real, let's say, star is here, and we live here on Earth. And uh, you don't see like a straight line, as we would say a straight line in, in flat space from that star. Instead, light moves in a trajectory that's effectively curved by this gravitational field. And this is, of course, far exaggerated, this amount of curving, unless if you have a black hole here. So in fact, to us, it looks like that star is at a different position. We extrapolate its position here while, in fact, it's here. And so this is, this is called the gravitational landing. The bending angle is very famous. It uh, actually is non-zero in classical uh, gravitation. If you didn't know about GR, you would get this to be not zero. You could do Newton's law for uh, be, uh, 
for light going around, but you would get half of this value. So it's one of the great point mass. Stern gravitational lensing is the most familiar kind. This is when you get multiple images from a source. So typically you have a faraway galaxy or quasar, and you have something in front, the foreground object. It could be a galaxy or cluster of galaxies, and you see multiple images of the first thing. This was first discovered in 1970s. And this is a cosmological distances. Typically you'll get one arc second separation. Typically distances are a cosmological Z ballpark unity for both the foreground, uh, the lens and the source. So you have a source of light, you have a lens that maybe you see or maybe you don't even see, and then you see multiple images. What's the probability, if I look at a galaxy in the universe, what's the probability it'll be multiply imaged? About one part in a thousand. So if you think about having, um, you know, um, maybe a million images, good images of galaxies and one in a thousand is imaged, maybe you'll have a thousand instances of multiple imaging, which is, we have, I think, several hundred. Okay, so here's another picture. You have a source object, a lens, and here's us. And light, there's only one source, but light goes this way and goes that way. Ideally, it could even show up as a ring, but most of the time you don't see a perfect so-called Einstein ring. You see multiple images, you get three images or five images. Now, strong lensing is very good for astrophysics and cosmology. If you could, uh, because everything is known, if you know the geometry, you, you, you can predict everything. So for example, maybe I have a hope of measuring distance to the source galaxy or distance to the lens. That is all true. And many people wrote papers on this and I even did in my time. The problem is that to get ahead in this game, you have to understand the distribution of mass around the foreground galaxy. That distribution, not only do you need to know the mass, it's not nice like this, it's not circular, it has a lot of features, maybe it's even multiple galaxies. Needless to say that you only see the bright light from that galaxy, you don't see the dark matter, and most of the mass is dark matter. So that is one great difficulty with strong lensing, that you really need a lot of information about this uh, lens galaxy in order to have that known, and then you can measure the distances, and then you can do cosmology. This is why strong lensing is not on my list of most of best probes of dark matter and dark energy, which is a list I showed yesterday, I think. Instead, what we work off of is a really uh, kind of amazing method uh, that it's amazing that it works, but we in precision cosmology, it's called weak gravitational lensing. Here you have a, here's a picture where here we are today, and this is a past, Ratchet to one, and light, the blue things are galaxies, and the orange thing is dark matter and all of matter. So um, light from galaxies travels to us, but as it travels, it's bent uh, by uh, logical structure. And so it gets elongated, it get, gets egg-shaped, right? So if you think about starting with a round image of a galaxy, it looks like an egg when it arrives to us. It is sheared by going through logical structure. Uh, and so if you had a perfectly circular galaxy, you would measure the shear, the egg shapeness, and you can infer the total amount of structure. Because galaxies are very unfortunately not circular, you can only, um, you don't, one galaxy measurement tells you nothing about the amount of structure, and two doesn't tell you very much. But if you have measurements of 100,000 galaxies, here's a picture of many blue things are galaxies, and remember the orange thing is matter distribution that's between us and those distant galaxies they will be preferentially lined up. That is to say, if I have two galaxies near each other, their light, let's say I have this galaxy and this galaxy, their light came from similar large structure on the way to us. So it's likely that they'll be sheared in a similar direction. So this little extra shear they'll get from, from gravitational lensing effect is more likely than not to be in the same direction. So again, you look at the whole thing looks, it's not completely random, it would be random, except there's some tendency for them to correlate. You can see it by eye because there's a small effect here. I circle this just to help you <clears throat> make the point, but you cannot look by eye at these shears and, and see the effect of lensing. You have to do it statistically. Here's another picture. This is, if light just came to you from those galaxies, they would be sheer, they would be egg-shaped. Maybe they look like this. They actually look more complicated, as you know. But because their light came from the same logical structure, there's a very small effect where they are, they, are, they are elongated. So if you, for example, if you look at some of them, they are more elongated along this direction. 
again, I, you're not even supposed to see that by eye. Maybe you can in this cartoon picture, but in real life, you cannot see it by eye. It's too small of an effect to see by eye. Uh, here's another illustration. Let's say you have a circular object. Its light is going from us. It's passing through large case structure. These bendings are way too exaggerated just to make the point. And they arrive at us today. If you started with a circle, you end up with an ellipse. Of course, you don't start with circles to begin with, which is why you cannot do, you know, you need like 100,000 galaxies to detect their preference to line up together. So that goes under the name of weak gravitational lensing. It's been predicted in 1960s, goes way back, worked out more in the 1990s. It was a small effect, very challenging to measure. And then in year 2000, there was a banner year. I was in grad school. Some of you were getting born, maybe a little bit before that. But uh, four teams, about the same time, announced they had the first detection of weak lensing. And today, weak lensing is considered to be one of the best probes of dark matter and dark energy. Uh, first of all, as you map out the distribution of these shapes, these shapes of galaxies, uh, it's like a spin two field. They're little sticks, right? Little stick tells you which way the galaxy is. So if you think about it, every stick in this picture is, uh, is like a shape of a galaxy. The longer the stick, the more elongated it is. Now you can, this is a field on the sky and you can describe it as E modes and B modes, just like we do for C and B polarization. If you have an underdense and overdense point on the sky, there's more density at some point in space. Galaxies that are behind it and around it are going to be lined up either this way if it's underdense or that way if it's overdense. This is the only kind of pattern that statistically you should be seeing. The kind of pattern that you should not be seeing is the E modes. And indeed, you expect E modes have all information, B modes should be zero. This graph is kind of obsolete. This is all data from the ES, the ES early release, but this is the power spectrum of E mode. So you think about this as the kind of power spectrum of, of those sticks being uh, um, correlated, right? Uh, and that's measured statistically significant and the B modes are zero. Okay, so again, to, to emphasize the key thing is what do we measure? We measure the power spectrum not of these points of their positions, but of their shears. So each galaxy, let's say this one has a pretty big shear because it's pretty elongated, but this one has lower shear that it's, it's rounder. You know, shear would be zero if it were perfectly round. You correlate them and you find statistically that the, generally speaking, the ones that are close are lined up in the same direction while the ones that are farther away are not, they don't care about each other. They're not lined up in the same direction. It's a small effect. Okay, so this can be completely worked out from scratch. And the formula is that the power spectrum of basically shear, there's the power spectrum now in multiple space. So what am I doing? I'm doing multiple space. Don't worry about that. Again, it's this correlation of shears is equal to the integral of the P of K. So the power spectrum times some geometrical factor. Geometrical half factor has distances and has W and the function W has more distances. Distances and the number density. Here, chi is the radial distance and R, R is the commoving distance. So there's a bunch of distance stuff, okay? So if you look at the basics of just normal gravitational lensing, which we didn't have time to do, obviously, there are some familiar geometrical terms and they kind of stick around. And so it makes sense that the geometry of the setup makes sense. And then this integral is saying the lensing is happening everywhere in space when there's matter. And power spectrum is telling you roughly what the clustering of matter is. So the more matter, so roughly speaking, is the, more, the bigger the power spectrum is the bigger the shear. That is to say, if matter didn't cluster, you wouldn't get any, any shears to cluster, right? So you get it's proportional to the matter power spectrum and the geometrical factors. This is actual formula for uh, what we are measuring in weak lensing. Okay, so weak lensing, why this is like kind of hard. It's really hard to measure because galaxies, of course, have elliptic of their own. So you're measuring a tiny little extra effect. The problems is that it's sensitive. This is the quantity you measure. It's sensitive to this. It's sensitive to all matter. So all matter. It's not where you look and you just look at galaxies. You're only seeing the visible parts. It's sensitive to all of the matter. And even more importantly, there's no bias because the thing you measure here is PM. It's the matter power spectrum. 
Every other time you measure clustering in cosmology, see of galaxies, you measure galaxy power spectrum, which is related to the matter power spectrum by bias. And from Fabian Schmidt's lectures, you know that bias has um, 15 terms. Okay, I'm making up a number. There are many terms, there are gradients and, and all kinds of complications. And you, you expend a lot of effort trying to model bias, right? And how many parameters, it's not just a constant. So you lose a lot of information by the time you're modeling bias. So it's really a cosmologist's dream to measure power spectrum without the bias, to measure just this PM. The only time you get to do that when you do lensing, because this thing here is PM. It, you know, there is no bias in the weak lens. Okay, so that's a huge advantage. And of course, it's sensitive geometry and structure. There are no cons except there are lots of systematics. Atmospheric distortions will mess you up. Uh, they, for example, if you have, if you go to a mountain near where you live and you don't have to happen to live in Chile or Hawaii, Big Island or Antarctica or <laughs> whatever the best locations are, the atmosphere will mess it up. It will round the shapes of galaxies. You'll be getting a lot of things wrong. And so a lot of things can go wrong in the measurements really. But on the theory side, it's wonderful. It's just that the measurements are generally tough. Uh, so here uh, I am, I talked about weak lensing. Let me see if there are any quick questions on weak lensing. I will take a look at the chat. Macro lensing, I'm not gonna talk about now. Um, lensing in galaxy power spectrum. No, galaxy power spectrum is different from lensing. I'm gonna say a few more words about that. They are separate things. Uh, massive gravity, oh, well, these people are still talking about this. Okay, techniques. Gravity is not producing B modes. I'm gonna say that in a moment, why? What's the view, time delays? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question uh, by Oinabi. Time, because when you do time delays, you do this kind of strong lensing and there, there they model the structure of the Lengths galaxy very carefully. So that's how they get ahead. So there are, there are some exceptions to what I said. You know, if you spend a lot, it, it's very hard job to model the lens carefully. Okay, so why do we not have a bias? Because I don't have a great quick explanation uh, why we don't have a bias, but um, bias comes from galaxies that are clustering and um, that uh, the peaks cluster more than the field. And Fabian talked about this. He, he had that really jig jag plot. Uh, and explain that. And that kind of thing is not what you're doing here. Uh, so you're doing a different thing. So I, I don't have a great intuitive explanation, but you don't have that picture that Fabian showed of galaxies clustering together. You're rather doing a different thing where you're correlating peaks and they just respond to the amount of matter. Somebody had that question about earlier. All right, somebody asked, why do you not see B modes? If you think about it, here's over in Argentines and I put some galaxies around, their light is coming. And you can even just by kind of doing simple logic, even without too much physics, understand that if anything, these under and over density are gonna stretch or squeeze a galaxy a light beam, so to speak, its shape. Why would it ever turn it to 45 degrees? That wouldn't happen. So that's just kind of a, everything has to be happening radially or tangentially in this case. You know, getting a 45 degree thing would be quite bizarre. So that's kind of just, a, plain common sense explanation why you don't get emotes. I like that explanation. It's not very physics-y, but it's sort of, um, okay. And um, did we have any other questions? Galaxy, galaxy lensing, I'm gonna talk about it in a moment. Oh no, the word bias is different. The word bias is used, unfortunately it's an overused word. And uh, yes, and somebody, Andrea is explaining. So bias means a lot of things, you know, and unfortunately there are some words, bias means, you know, I'm biased toward basketball as opposed to, I don't know, baseball or something, right? There's that bias. But this, but when we say galaxy bias in cosmology or just bias, we mean this B term that multiplies the over density that is B squared and multiplies matter power spectrum get. This is what we refer to when you say bias. And so bias is, is not a bias towards something. This is this galaxy bias function that you normally have to model that now for once you don't have to worry about. Okay, so I move on. Somebody asked about galaxy galaxy. There's something called galaxy galaxy language. This is one of the worst uh, names in cosmology. This is my top three bad name in cosmology. It took me only 10 years to understand what people are talking about. I don't have a picture, unfortunately. If you take one foreground galaxy, one galaxy kind of not 
super far away and look at the galaxies behind it, not exactly behind it, but near it and behind it, you can look at the shear of those galaxies near this foreground galaxy. They will only be, you basically have this case, you're looking at the galaxy here, and now you look at, you don't look at it, you look at the galaxies behind it, and those, their shear will basically, because you have over density, they'll be tangential. Not exactly like this, but they'll have the tendency to be tangential. And so therefore, correlated with every galaxy in the front, you can look at shapes of galaxies. You correlate to this position with shapes of galaxies behind. This is why this should really be called galaxy galaxies lensing. It's unfortunately called galaxy galaxy lensing. So that's really correlation between galaxy position and shear. And that's also a powerful method in cosmology. So now you actually have three things. So bear with me here and uh, draw your attention to this figure. Uh, this figure is showing, I'm sitting here, there's a foreground galaxy, and then there are background galaxies. And sorry, my phone is ringing for some reason. Um, and so in that case, um, you can do the following. You can correlate positions of, say, foreground galaxies. Then you're just doing galaxy correlation function. That's this term GG. It's just correlating galaxies. It's not galaxy-galaxy lensing, unfortunately. It's just cor correlation function of galaxies, power spectrum. You can correlate shears at the behind. So you're correlating these shapes. You correlate shape with the shape. So this is SS. You're correlating shapes with shapes. Or you can take, so this is correlating positions. This is correlating shapes. Or you can do a mix. You can correlate with every foreground galaxy. You can correlate its position with shapes of things usually near it. This is called a galaxy. It's a galaxy shear correlation function. It has a horrible name of galaxy galaxy lensing. Right, so galaxy galaxy lensing is this GS term. So now there are three famous things. Uh, the most famous is just clustering of galaxies. Probably the most powerful is uh, shear power spectrum, shear shear. And then there's this cross correlation. You can do all three of them. You say, why do I have to just pick one? Do all three of them. They kind of form a matrix, and you call that three times two. So this is now kind of cutting edge research. People talk about three five times two. Correlation. This is only a few years old, the concept that you can kind of organize them in a matrix. If you only had one redshift bin uh, and one bin in angle, you would have literally a two by two matrix organized like this. Because you have a choice of a number of foreground bins, number of radial bins for where the black thing is, and number of bins for where the blue is, the and number of angle bins this is actually some huge matrix that looks complicated. But each element in the matrix is a measurement. This is called three by two, so it's combining all these things. So three by two is now kind of the main thing that DES is doing, that KIDS is doing, and that I think the future surveys will be doing. Like I said, you can do a lot with large scale structure. You can count galaxies, you can look at voids, you can search for non-Gaussianity, you can do a lot of things, but this is the main thing you can do. So here's an example from DES year one measurements. Here I'm showing a shear clustering. So this is shear shear correlation. It's it's not in multiple space. It's in real space, in configuration space. So it's it's called xi. Don't worry about plus. Xi plus is one of them. Xi plus multiply by theta as a function of theta. So data points are data. This is measurements in so this is galaxies in bin one correlated in bin two and bin three and bin four. And then I take every galaxy in bin two correlate with any galaxy in bin one as a function of angle, I get this cross correlation. Black is measurements, blue is best fit lambda CDM model, orange is zero, and gray is showing where we don't do the measurements because we don't trust how we, how we understand theory. So because this is small scales, it's hard to model. And you can see that, yeah, we, there are great measurements. This is a very high signal to noise measurement of shear. So that's a shear shear term. Then going back, look at the bottom here. This is the simplest term. It's just galaxy clustering, galaxy galaxy. And for some reason, we did the same as what this student mentioned recently in question session and Rogerio confirmed that we do this in the ES. We just look at the clus galaxy clustering of galaxies in bin one, bin two, to bin five. So this is just clustering of galaxies. And then this is that galaxy galaxy lensing where you correlate galaxy position with in the front with galaxy shear at the back. And you can do any kind of permutation. You can do galaxies in bin one with shears in bin two, 
or galaxies in bin two with shears in bin one, you get measurements. So you can combine all these apples and oranges, okay? And this is what we do. I'm going to stop in a moment here because uh, I didn't want to go too long about this. So this is from this information, the DES, for example, measures omega matter. And S8 is like sigma 8. So sigma 8 is the function we coded up yesterday. Here we scale with the omega matter to some power, call it S8, just because this is a combination that goes well together. So roughly speaking, both sigma 8 and omega matter, and therefore S8, the more matter you have, the more, bo more bigger thing you get, okay? That, that's, that's what really large scale structure series are. This is the first thing that large scale structures is sensitive to. And here you see Planck, of course, constrains everything, including that. DES is here. It looks like by I, they don't agree. They actually agree, okay, if you do a statistics more careful and then you can combine them, get the red contour. So let me see if there are any questions now. Let me see, how do I get back to my... I lost, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, so let me take a look at some quick questions then I'll move on to statistics. That's all I have about gravitational lensing. Um, galaxies definitely align. Oh, galaxies align Felipe in the way I know, uh, said. So if you have an over density, then they would be tangential to it. But with more complicated distribution of large scale structure, you have to both stimulate it statistically and measure it. Okay. Um, I'm gonna skip a question about gravitational wave. It's, it's gonna take me a little bit beyond and I have to get to other stuff. Oh, other top two misnomers. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Joao, let me just say one of them is a recombination that I think should be called combination, okay? But maybe it's just me. That's two out of three now. I forget what the third one is. It's called three by two because there are three things in that matrix. And there are three two point correlation functions. That's why it's called three point two because there's G, 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 S, and S, S, so it's three times two-point correlation function. Oh, and uh, Joao answered that. Yes, thank you. Any other questions on lensing? So weak lensing is the main thing. One could spend a semester talking about lensing in general, but we won't. You know, this is, uh, this is good. It's uh, good to understand weak lensing, at least at the gut level. It's a very, very good, very promising probe. It's about 20 years old now in, the, in practice. So uh, let me move on in the interest of time and uh, to statistical methods. And this is something that I really feel always when I teach classes in cosmology is important to uh, cover at a good level because it's, um, it's very useful. So let me first breeze through some fundamentals. If X is a random variable, P of X is greater than zero non-negativity, P is probability or likelihood for the moment I'll mix those terms, it's normalized. The first not completely trivial thing is marginalizing over say another parameter means doing this operation. So if you have probability of two things, you marginalize over X1 by integrate over it. And then you have a very basic thing. You have lowest moments, mean. If you have some distribution, you have mean. This is the definition of a mean. Median is when you integrate and get to a half. So here's my toy example. So mean and medium are very close to in this case. And mode is where it peaks. So mean, median, and mode, they all agree for the Gaussian, but they disagree in general for arbitrary distribution. These are just basic things that are good to know. By the way, if you are learning about statistics, uh, you all know that learning physics from internet is a terrible thing, okay? <laughs> it's really not good. I mean, I know people watch Lenny Skuskin's lectures on GR and all of that, but you don't learn physics from reading the internet, right? You, you need a book, a course, a school, etc. Actually, statistics is really, you can find some decent answers on the internet. Wikipedia in particular is a pretty good resource for things like this, looking up the mean, the median, or even more complicated things. I will have references at the back of my lectures here, but uh, you know, this is, statistics is one place where in Wikipedia in particular can be helpful. Moving on, you have variance. That's a second order. So the variance is expectation value of uh, random variable minus its mean squared. So this is a function for the variance. And you can define higher moments, skewness, kurtosis, etc. For whatever reason in cosmology, we really quite rarely use skewness kurtosis, not very often. On occasion, we more talk about three-point correlation function in the bi spectrum. So these are not super duper popular in cosmology. Of course, they are useful to know about. 
Then moving on, you have estimators. So now this is Natalie earlier today had a question about estimators. So I say, I have a N things, what's the mean? I have N students, what's their average age? I sum up, I divide by N and that's my estimator for the mean. Now I can say that means a student's average age is actually some true number or in the ensemble, but uh, uh, in, 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 in the world, in, in the ensemble, but I only have n samples, so I'm going to get estimate of the mean. So I have a little hat. It's an estimate of the mean. It's not equal to the truth, but it's the best I can do. And all of you, if you had to estimate the mean, you would have done this. Also, if you had to estimate variance, you know this is how you get variance. Now, okay, you do need to know a little bit more statistics to remember you have to divide by n minus one, not n but you can derive that this is the best estimate of variance. So this was easy. This is a little bit harder, but we don't think about it. In both cases, we had an estimator. But now I tell you, okay, get me the power spectrum, please, or something more complicated, or some, you know, estimate something else from the data. Then it gets more interesting because the question is, what kind of estimator should I have? It should be unbiased. So on average, you get the right answer. And then as minimal, error really variance is possible. So this is what leads to best unbiased estimator. And most of the time we want a full, a full um, posterior distribution on some parameter, I'm gonna talk about it, but sometimes you want estimators, for example, Landy Soleil estimator. And Natalia asked earlier today, how do you find an estimator? There's really no one way to do it. You have to kind of sniff around and try to figure out how to build an estimator for something. Okay, so it's good to know that Sometimes we need estimators. Moving right along, Gaussian distribution is probably similar, you know, familiar to everyone. Like I said in these notes, I'll have things that almost everyone knows. Also be familiar with n-dimensional Gaussian. Gaussian has these properties, plus minus one sigma enclosing 68.3%, et cetera. Uh, now it turns out that Gaussian is by far the most useful in, uh, distribution in cosmology partly because inflation predicts and we measure very nearly Gaussian uh, linear density field and CMB field. In fact, non-Gaussianity corresponds to FNL less than five. So at least one kind of non-Gaussianity is spinned down to be less than one part in 10,000 because FNL of something like 30,000 corresponds to, to really kind of, you could see by, you could look at the CMB by eye and tell it's wrong. That would be FNL of 30,000. So this is incredibly small effect I played with this once, I don't have my slides, but to, if I show you two maps and one has FNL of zero and one has non-zero FNL, I would have to bump up the non-zero one to a thousand just for you to, to squint by eye and see they're different. So this is incredibly tight constraint. Uh, and the next generation of surveys will be checking out non-Gaussianity to, to, to more precisely. Um, so Gaussian distribution is important. Chi-square distribution is the next most important one. This is what everybody should know at some level if you are studying physics uh, of any flavor that you get uh, chi-square distribution if you have squares of Gaussians. So if you have Gaussian random variable as X, if you square them and them up, you get, if you at K of them, you get chi-square distribution with K degrees of freedom. So if you just had one Gaussian squared, you get chi-squared with one degree of freedom, which is the, this one, the yellow line then two, and then as you add more and more of them, they look more and more Gaussian, but, uh, but it is non-Gaussian in principle. So important properties of this, this is Wikipedia is great for chi-square distribution. I can't tell you the number of times I went to Wikipedia page for this. It's mean is K, the number of degrees of freedom, the number of these Gaussians enter. Its variance is actually 2K, no square, it's 2K. So it's not squared relative to this. And for K much greater than one, it looks like a Gaussian. Where, where do we need chi-squared? We need it a lot. First of all, there are two examples where we need it. First of all, when you form this quantity, when you say I have something measured minus the mean divided by the error, say of the data, and I square them, say I kept it chi-squared. Uh, this, is, this is when I use property, could use properties of chi-squared distribution, right? Because this thing in the exponent is literally chi-squared divided by two. So when you need chi-squared when you're calculating chi-squared, <laughs> so to speak. Another time you need it is oftentimes our density field is Gaussian for us most of the time, but it's power spectrum. It's like density field squared. So it's chi-square distributed. For example, 
uh, if the ALMs, the, so the temperature, the components of the temperature density field, they're Gaussian, the CLs of the CMB being ALM squared are chi squared distributed with two L plus one degree of freedom. So when you look at the plot of the power spectrum, the cosmic microwave background, it's every point should be chi squared distributed. As you go to high L, it becomes Gaussian, right? Because it looks like Gaussian at high L. By the low degrees of freedom at low L, it's very definitely non-Gaussian. You see these, some of these shapes at low K here, they definitely look not Gaussian. Okay, let me see questions so far. Okay, the only question that I see that I'll answer is what's degrees of freedom? In this case, degrees of freedom is how many Gaussian random variables did you square in order to get your new variable Y? So that's the number of K, that's the number of degrees of freedom. That's literally, if I literally take a Gaussian thing and square it, you can take a Gaussian distribution, square it, and you'll get this one. You'll take two, square them, you'll get this one. So it's literally how many. Were there any other questions in the chat? I couldn't see any other question that pertains to this uh, discussion. Um, uh, so Oinabi, I will maybe how between, let me maybe move this on to later, potentially even for discussion tomorrow, because it would take me off topic a little bit and, um, remember that question and we can, we can do, but, but, uh, let me, let me continue in this line of thought. Okay. Uh, I guess uh, let me let me move on for the moment, and then we'll come back to more. All right. So I did breeze through this a little bit faster, but it's kind of more basic things. Likelihood. Okay. So likelihood can be Gaussian. So if I have um, likelihood means what? I can have, for example, theoretical quant theoretical expectation for quantity mu, and I can have a measured value x, and I do this operation. I have a vector, right, of those things, and I can form likelihood, I can say Gaussian is likelihood, likelihood is Gaussian, okay? So likelihood or probability, if you want to call it, let's say comparing to theory, to data, or I can compare two different theories or two different data sets, I can do a lot of things, I have a likelihood. Let me get to my, one of my most favorite points here that are confusions. People throw the word Gaussian a lot, just like the word bias is overused, the word Gaussian is overused. People say, oh, something is Gaussian. But there's an immediate question here. When my you know, first year graduate students say something is Gaussian, I ask, which thing is Gaussian? Because there are two different spaces here. There's a space of theory and there's a space of data. And I'm a theorist, so for me, data is say the power spectrum. So power spectrum, something measured with an error bar to me is data. Okay, for real observer data is like photons of the sky and images. But for me, data is measure things with error bars and theory is theory, right? So you can talk about Gaussianity of this thing and Gaussianity of that thing. And I wanna distinguish the two and I want this to be clear to you that these are two different worlds. Um, if you talk about data, Usually it's okay to assume that data is Gaussian. Why? Because you look at the point like plot like this. So you have a bunch of measurements and each data point is probably non-Gaussian. You can even squint at some of them and you'll see that the central value is not in the middle of the two ends of the error bars. So it's non-Gaussian, but if you take many of them, you agree, you are rely on the central limit theorem that says as n goes to infinity, um, the whole thing can be assumed to be Gaussian. So you can assume this to be your likelihood where X is the data values and mu is say this line, some theory, you can apply this equation most of the time. That's because of the central limit theorem, as long as you have a bunch of measurements. If you have two measurements, it's not a good approximation, but if you have a hundred, it's a very good approximation. So this thing is Gaussian most of the time. What about theory? Theory is a distribution of posterior of the final likelihood right in these parameters. So for example, you're looking at contours or error bars in some parameters, say, say this plane. And you can even see from this random picture that this posterior, or if you want to call it likelihood, this level is most likely not Gaussian most of the time. So in the data level, due to the CLT, you can assume things are Gaussian. 
you really cannot most of the time assume this is Gaussian. You get these distributions usually, so you don't need to assume anything, but they won't be Gaussian. And even single measurements, say Hubble constant measure from some experiment is 73, but maybe the plus and the minus deviations are not the same because it's gonna be non-Gaussian. Okay, that's my important point to distinguish these two worlds. Uh, then I go into Bayesian and frequency statistics for a bit. So let me move on to this. So you have great divisions in the world. You have the Los Angeles Lakers or the Celtics, if you like, basketball, Real Madrid or Barcelona. Where I live, it's Michigan or Ohio State. That's a big question. Uh, Romeo and Juliet reference, Rocco Classical. Because this is school out of Brazil, I had to put Brazil or Argentina. That's a big eternal question, right? Which, which one are you favoring, say, in soccer? Equally big and equally uh, debated is Bayesian or frequentist. So this is a division, a schism in uh, statistics that's very old. And if you're a statistician, you know that you're Bayesian or frequentist. You know which one you are, okay? So these are two looks at the world. They're both correct, but you have a choice which one you join. To a frequentist, model is fixed and data are repeatable. To a Bayesian, data are fixed and model is repeatable. And Bayesians rely on the so-called Bayes theorem that says if these data M is model, P of model given data, which is usually what you want, by the way, usually you have some say dark energy or modified gravity model and you have some data. So you want what's the probability model given data is given as probability of data given a model, which is by the way, likelihood. Likelihood is usually P of data given model times prior on the space of model divided by this uh, probability of the data, which often doesn't really matter as you do this. It's called Bayes' theorem. So Bayesians rely on the Bayes' theorem. So say, for example, H0 is 72 plus minus 2. Then how do these two groups see the world? See this. Bayesians say the posterior distribution for H0 has 68% of its integral between 70 and 74. This posterior can then be used as a prior for any new application of Bayes' theorem and new measurements. Frequentist says, performing the same procedure will cover the real value of H0 68% of the time. If you, you know, uh, so this, this, it'll be 60% of the time in this interval between uh, 70 and 74. Of course, the difficulty with frequentist here is how do I repeat the same procedure if I only have one universe, right? How do I repeat the same measurements? Okay. So I'm gonna say a little bit more good references for this are Roberto Trotta. This is like Bible of the Bayes, uh, Bayesians. Uh, Bayesian method is dominant in cosmology. This Bayes in the sky. I, I highly recommend this. And if you are working in anything statistical related in cosmology, I highly recommend this excellent Feldman and Cousins paper from 1997, which is a frequentist method. Okay. Also, if you want one example of cosmology application where both Bayesian and frequentist methods were applied, if you're getting confused, how do they differ, which is a very common point of confusion, you can check out this paper by George F. Statue where he does some things with the CMB, both frequentist and Bayesian way. I found this paper to be helpful to understand. Uh, Bayesian method can give probability for models, which sounds really nice. You can give probability for dark energy model or for neutrino mass greater than zero for all kinds of things. It depends on both prior and likelihood of data. And it's currently the dominant model in method in cosmology. Bayesian dominates. Frequentist doesn't give probability of models only of hypotheses. So you have to claim your hypothesis. It can be even that you know neutrino mass is greater than zero, or it can be any hypothesis, and then you can reject it or not reject it. You have binary choice once you do your frequentist thing. It doesn't depend on the prior, just the likelihood, which frequentists like and Bayesians like the opposite, that it does depend on the so these are two philosophies. And this is actually currently the dominant method in particle physics. So particle physicists, experimental particle physicists, they are um, frequentists. Okay, so that was good. Let me see if there are any questions. No questions about this yet. Okay, and all right, so let me move on to uh, so that's a free Bayesian and frequentist, and I have some of that in my in the in the lecture notes set that I posted uh, that was posted on Monday or Tuesday. 
So here's another useful thing. Which credible interval, say you get some posterior likelihood, depending on how you're doing things. So what do you report? So I have some words here. You peak of your posterior is the best fit. So that should be reported. And then you have some choices about the error bars, but um, you are really supposed to calculate, you know, maybe I can just, you don't quote, you don't calculate the, the moments, you don't calculate the variance, take square root and say, that's my sigma. That would be a mistake. So here I have some text. Don't worry about this text on this slide. Basically the question is how do you report 68 and 95 in such uh, regions? Then the very naive thing would be to take a distribution very naive thing would be take this distribution, calculate, okay, here's my best fit value, it's 1.28. It turns out this is my, say, say it's my posterior on some parameter x. So I say it's 0.28 plus minus what? Oh, let me calculate the variance and take square root. That would be wrong. Instead, what you do is the following. I have a little movie here. So you lower, you think about almost like a lowering the level of water. You go down and down until you enclose a region that's 68% of the total area because you here you have one day. Again, you lower and lower and lower up until you hit left and right where you chop off 68% of the total area. And once you do that, you say from this peak to the left edge is the minus value, you have minus 0.76 and from the peak, to the, you know, from the, from the, where it cuts on the right to the peak is plus, what is it? Plus 1.02. So this is, I hope this helps. This is how you're supposed to report uh, confidence level of your parameter. If you measured something below likelihood, here's your likelihood of your posterior. Say you did Bayesian analysis, you did everything. Here's your posterior on some parameter. This is how you quote it. You go from the peak, you go down up until you close 68%, you report plus minus. If you want 95% interval, you go further down. That would be Gaussian to a sigma until you enclose 95.4%. And then you say that's my plus minus two sigma. Now, what happens if you have multiple peaks in this? There would be a very perverse case. If you had multiple high peaks in this posterior, then that very rarely happens, very rarely. But then you would report two intervals. You would say x is either 1.28 plus minus something, or it's 2.55 plus this minus that. Okay, so that, that you, you simply report. All right. So this is uh, this is what I this is the kind of picture I find helpful to think about how to report confidence level if, in case, God forbid, if in case you measure something, right? If you if you if you do measurement, then that's okay. Next topic. We're doing well on time here. So um, next topic is Fisher information matrix. Let me first couple of questions. P of D is estimated by, right, mathematically. Yes, it's posterior, Matteo is answering. Thank you, Matteo, it's normalization. So you just integrate that. What same thing for every distribution, sorry. Yeah, you, you have to do this thing for every distribution. No matter what you do, distribution is, it can be some curve. You, you go down, lower the level of water until you hit, you know, you hit 68% of the area and that's when you're 60, 68. You have to do it for every distribution. That's a must do thing. Somebody was asking you, how do you get P of D in the base? Oh, they already passed it. Sorry, I, uh... so P of D, you get this by integrating the numerators. So this is integral of P of dm, P of mdm. It's actually a very tough integral to do. It's typically a multidimensional integral. We don't need to worry about that anymore unless if uh, there are questions. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about Fisher information matrix. This is, I'm a huge fan of Fisher matrix. Um, and I want to, not like that I'm the only one, the world loves Fisher matrix, but people often, uh, anyway, th th this is a really good thing to know about. So remember, we have those two spaces, theory and data, and you have a, you know, you would like some constraint. Imagine you have some data, you can, I tell you, well, we'll have the space telescope, we'll have wonderful data, we'll have 1000 measurements of the shear with such and such quality. Can you tell me how well could you, could you measure parameters in this plane? If I told this to a grad student, this would be a huge project for them. Huge project because they have to do a Monte Carlo simulation. They have to simulate data. They have to simulate it once, get a point here, simulate another time. They have to simulate data a lot. 
and then they have to eventually so this is like i don't know a year long project or something it's a huge project for smaller jobs you can do this but still uh, if I tell you some quality of the data, what are, how well you can say parameters, that's a pretty, you have to do a Monte Carlo simulation, right? People have heard of Monte Carlo, I hope. Fisher matrix circumvents that, and it tells you it's a theory formula almost. You have to evaluate it numerically. Given data and its error bars, what are the errors in theory parameters? This is what Fisher matrix tells you with almost no effort. And uh, normally requires Monte Carlo's very time consuming and noisy. And I'm going to tell you in a moment why. Uh, this is noisy. It's noisy because I tell you, oh, okay, that was a thousand point. I changed my mind. Now we'll actually have slightly smaller error bars in high theta, and we'll have slightly slightly different details. Then you have to run a new set of Monte Carlos, but you will have some noise in, in this procedure, how you're doing it. So you're going to have a very hard time distinguishing small changes in the quality of the constraint given small changes in the data. That's going to be really hard to pick out, and this is a great tool to have it. So this is a fantastic tool, no stochastic noise in Fisher matrix. Fisher matrix work off of the, this is a definition of the Fisher matrix. It's an N by N matrix uh, where N is a number of cosmological parameters. Uh, this definition, it's a second order. It's a second derivative. It's like a negative Hessian of a likelihood around the peak. But really, if you work out this expression, you can find that, uh, look, this is all going to be a little hard to understand until I give an example. So it's, if you take the mean, everything here is theoretical. Mu is the mean of your theory vector. So in my weak lensing example, this was a, a, a vector of 500 measurements of shear as a function of theta. C is the covariance matrix. So it's 500 by 500. Commas are derivatives with respect to cosmological parameters. I and J run over omega matter, neutrino mass, sigma eight, whatever you want to have. And this is a similar expression, except you had, if covariance matrix depends on parameters. Okay. So either this term stays or this term stays or both, but this is the expression for the Fisher matrix. Uh, so you get, if you have some measurements, any number of data points, and you have some number of cosmological parameters, say five, then you have a five by five matrix once you do the job. And then you work off of something called the kramer rao equality that says that the error bars cannot be smaller than, uh, really, this is a all in case, F inverse, take the i-th i-th element square root. So to cut a long story short, if I say this is the best error bar, you say just e equal to this error bar. So this is the best error bar I can get on some cosmological parameter. So I'm going to show you in a moment this five by five, say matrix is easy to get. Anyone can invert the matrix. Anyone can take the i-i element, take square root, and you get error bar on same. So say, for example, for omega matter, you take um, derivative of um, you, the i is a parameter corresponding to omega matter, and you just evaluate that element of the Fisher matrix inverse. OK, so I'm saying it's an easy to get matrix out of measured. You, this is all theoretical quantities. There's no actual real noisy data here. And then you have to just take some inverse and square root. So a couple of examples. Say I have type 1 a supernova when I have magnitude. So this is magnitude measurements to supernovae. So I have, they depend, theoretically, they depend on redshift, omega matter, omega lambda. So redshift and cosmological parameters. And the Fisher matrix is just that first term, right? So this, because if I take covariance to be diagonal, covariance inverse is just one over sigma squared. So I take each theoretical magnitude. Uh, so this is a theory formula. It's a log of a distance. So I take derivative with respect to, say, omega matter, or say, omega or w or whatever. So I'm basically taking derivatives of log distance with respect to C omega matter. I can do it numerically. I divide by the error bar on my magnitude that I expect from the survey. I sum it up. I get a five by five matrix, so whatever, three by three. And then I can just take, I can get forecasted error in cosmological parameters. So I don't need to simulate a supernova survey. All I need is a theoretical formula for what supernovae measure. And crucially, what error bar do I expect? Because depending on that error bar, I will get the Fisher matrix. Different. Another example is weak lensing. There, I am working off of this term because it turns out the first term. Either. So C is this shear power spectrum. So I take each, sorry, I used to call it P kappa, now I call it C kappa, I apologize. So this is a shear power spectrum that I can code up from theory. I am uh, you know, a theorist. So I take derivative respect to omega matter, W, neutrino mass, sigma eight, whatever. 
I do need covariance of these, and you know they can be uh, obtained using, say, Wick's theorem or something. So this gives me uh, information about also, among other things, how well I measure things. But I can get uh, I can get the Fisher matrix in those parameters, and then I'm I can get the forecasted error bars. So uh, so. Fisher matrix has many advantages. One is how do you marginalize over parameters? It's easy. So I have this Fisher matrix. I have forecasted parameters on the, uh, then I can get everything. So uh, I think, let's see, I think we really need this picture here. So let's say really what you're imagining is, this is by the way, a picture I made many years ago, some forecast. So Fisher matrix always produces ellipsoids. It zooms up these posteriors are Gaussian, which is an assumption, but you're cutting so many corners here that there's an assumption it's okay to take. So say for example, some Fisher matrix tells me, this is my forecasted supernova constraint. This is my forecasted weak lensing constraints in this plane. How do, you mar how do I marginalize over parameters that are not these two? How do I integrate over omega matter and maybe some others? You take the Fisher matrix, you invert it, you take a sub matrix in say this 2D plane, if I'm marginalizing over other parameters, in, I invert it back and that thing is my new Fisher matrix in this two by two space. Easy peasy, you are taking inverse of a five by five or 10 by 10 or something matrix. How do you plot this contour by the way? You say, okay, great. I have a two by two matrix for these two parameters, W0, WA. How do you plot it? This is a formula for ellipsoid, literally the formula where G11, G12, G22 are elements of this two by two matrix. And you have to, it turns out, cut it off at chi squared values. So in this case, this is 2.3 corresponding to this confidence level. How do you say I want area? Because I think the smallest area should be best. You know, smaller area is better. Some are long and skinny, some are short and fat, but area. Area is determinant of the Fisher matrix to the one half. So you need to take the determinant of a matrix. It's that easy. Oh, I'm curious what the best determined direction here is of this red contour. What's this linear combination of these two parameters? Easy peasy, you diagonalize F. In this case, you diagonalize G, that two by two subset. Um, you wanna add new constraints on say your supernova, you add the two Fisher matrices. You wanna combine two surveys, you add their Fisher matrices, literally. That, that same as multiplying likelihoods. You wanna add a prior to some parameter, you add something. Everything is easy with Fisher matrix, really, really easy. And my favorite part is say this Fisher bias formula, which is a slightly more advanced material. I think most people have not seen this. Um, you say, okay, let's do the same survey, but now I'm gonna have a slightly bigger density of galaxies and I'm gonna have a slightly different. It's the kind of question you could never answer with Monte Carlo simulation because a small change in what you're assuming would always be overwhelmed by noise in the end. Imagine I make such a small change that I only improve my constraints by 5% or 10% or 1%. In the Fisher matrix formalism, you can get that analytically. So it turns out this is a formula where if I make a small change in the, in say the power spectrum, there are a bunch of indices here, but the main thing to know is the right-hand side is just this theoretical formula and I get how much each cosmological parameter shifts. So you can literally say, if I, add one day of observation to my survey that lasted 10 years, how much would I improve? Fisher matrix can tell you that. So this is a great tool for forecasting things for survey. Those of you who are working on surveys or planning to look at data, future data, this is, the, this is by far the easiest way to go. So I just praised Fisher matrix to heaven. And now that I've done that, <laughs> let me see if there are any questions. Um, I didn't understand the question about the generalist diagrams. Maybe we can come back to it. Um, I'm marginalizing, I didn't see over which parameters, but I was marginalizing Xperia over like omega matter mainly, and maybe some other parameters. But you can marginalize over however many. Um, um, I think maybe I will move in with my last part and then we can leave the questions. You can't estimate the error in the survey without having, oh, without having a data. Well, you need to know something about quality of the data. So you know where you're gonna have a measurement. So you cannot, uh, this is a good question, uh, Walter. 
Um, and maybe, maybe uh, you, I'm going to rephrase your question. Maybe this wasn't your question, but it was to the effect, how do you know what's going to happen if you don't have a real data? Fisher matrix is not telling you where this will happen. It's not telling you where these constraints will take place. They are telling you how big the error bar is going to be roughly, right? So I center these by hand. These contours are put by hand at some model, right? Literally by hand. That part, Fisher matrix cannot see the future, okay? If you could see the future, I would apply to the stock market, first of all. It can't see the future. Uh, so you don't know where you're going to end up, but it can tell you with this quality of the data, this is the kind of error bar you should be getting. That's the main thing. That's what it's telling you. Okay, last piece of material for today, and probably the most important is, um, I'm almost doing well on time. I'm going to be just slightly over. Um, Markov chain Monte Carlo. And if you think about mapping out parameter space, parameter space in experiments is huge. These are some constraints from dark energy survey on famous parameters, but we had a 25 dimensional parameter space because we had five or six cosmology parameters and 20 nuisance parameters. These parameters that are bias values and efficiencies and things like that, that you don't care about, but you have to explore likelihood. And you know, as you go from 2D to 3D from real life, how much bigger space is 3D and 2D. But imagine going to 5D or 25D, it's a huge space. And you would never ever be able to explore likelihood or posterior in that space. Because imagine, let's just say there are 10 parameters, not 25. And let's say it takes you, uh, you're exploring models in that parameter space. Let's say you can calculate each model in one second, which is really fast. And let's say you want a grid in this parameter space. You want a grid. So for each combination of parameters, you'd like to see how well that model fits the data. Then the number of combinations is 20 values to the power of 10 parameters. So it's ballpark 10 to the 13. For at the second per model, you look, this goes out of control, 300,000 years for that example. In this space, you could never, ever, ever do it by brute force. You could never go on a grid in high dimensional space and explore the light. So it seems completely undoable. So one of the really incredibly clever solutions was uh, to, instead of grading sample this space, and that was invented in Los Alamos in the 1950s by some of the scientists who had previously worked on atomic bomb. It's called Markov Chain Monte Carlo MCMC. And Markov Chain Monte Carlo, the simplest thing is to cons consider so-called Metropolis Hastings algorithm. So you start at some parameter values in, let's say these omega matter W, neutrino mass, sigma eight, something. Then you propose to move to a new place. And then you calculate the likelihood on that new place compared to likelihood where you are now. So you at some place T, PT, at some values, and you randomly ask, should I be moving on these new values of cosmological parameters? You can compare the ratio of the two likelihoods. If you go to a higher likelihood, then always move. If you're going to a smaller likelihood, if likelihood this and one, you may or may not move, generate a random number, and if that random number is less than R move, then the random number is greater than R don't move. Repeat many times. So here's a picture. Let's say I'm here just 1D example. Normally you do this in say 10 dimensions or five dimensions of parameters. I'm here and I randomly uh, ask, should I go at, at this value of cosmological parameters? I mean, this value, should I go to this value? I calculate the likelihood. I don't know this full thing. I only know where I am and I only know what I'm proposing. I propose to go, if I propose to go to a higher value of likelihood, I always accept. If I ask about this value, I calculate likelihood here and see this is lower than that. Then my little r is something like, what would you say? This divided by this is like one third, right? Then I draw a random number. If the random number between zero and one is less than one third, then I move. If random number is greater than one third, then I stay and then I, propose again, and I keep proposing. So it turns out the longer, if you are at high in the likelihood, you'll be rejecting moves a lot of the time because you'll be proposing to move to lower likelihood. If you're low in the likelihood, most of the time you'll propose to go to higher. So you kind of stick around longer at some space if you're high in the likelihood and you don't stick around very much if you're here. So here I have a great movie. So I have a two dimensional space. I have P1 and P2 parameters. I don't know a priori this likelihood. This is my likelihood, but I don't know this. All I'm doing is I'm trying to build up this thing. This is how my likelihood in this space look. And I'm gonna, uh, in this space, of course, I could put a grid, right? I could put a grid here and I could 
explore every pair of P1 and P2. But a realistic uh, uh, case, you have 10 or 20 of these parameters. You have a huge space. You could never do a grid. So imagine this same kind of motion happens in 10 d space. Here, I'm just doing 2D. And so I run this movie. I'm at some spot, and then I propose a move here. It's going to a higher likelihood, so it's definitely going to move. Now, my pretty high likelihood, I propose randomly that's going lower. That was had a chance of being accepted, but rejected. This is going lower again. Turns out it was rejected. This is going lower. It could be potentially accepted. It was rejected. So because this is getting rejected a lot, I'm sticking around at this point, and I finally move to a new spot. Okay, after so now this move is being repeated. So you see, if you're at a low likelihood, you don't stick around very long. If you're at a high likelihood, you stick out longer. And in this random example, I stuck around for four, four steps. So my weight is going to be four, I think, right? Because all these moves were rejected. They had a chance to be accepted, but they were rejected. Uh, and so finally, after step four. So this is at the heart of this. You, How many of such steps you do? You do maybe 100,000 steps. Well, that sounds a lot, but it's a lot less, less than 10 to the 13, right? That was the number, random, you know. So this is always much, 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 much less than it would be. So I kind of cleverly walk in this space to get a feel of where the big likelihood is. But I also check out the periphery a little bit by occasionally jumping away just to see how it looks there. And you can prove that this Metropolis Hastings algorithm leads to the correct posterior. That is, if I after 10,000 to 100,000 steps, I recover. If I plot a histogram of weights, I recover this purple blue area. And in fact, that's how you analyze MCMCs. You literally write parameter combinations. So you have like 100,000 or million rows. And each row is a parameter combination at that point. These are, remember, omega matter, W, and et cetera. And then I put their weights in some table. The bigger weight means that this was a very popular combination. This was a pretty high posterior. Uh, lower weight means it wasn't so popular. So I literally pick off the most, th these weights are basically the values of my posterior. So for example, if these three rows are all I had, that means that this would be the best, the most likely, the highest posterior combination of cosmological parameters. So this is really wonderful. It's much, much, much faster than, than the impossible brute force method. And doing things like, for example, marginalizing over other parameters is also easy in this scheme, which is maybe, I won't say much more about it if I. So this is incredibly clever. This is like Nobel Prize for genius, whoever invented this, because this is really amazing, makes an intractable problem very much tractable. And these days, when we are obtaining cosmological constraints from any survey, we basically have to use this method. We use it. And you can write an MCMC from scratch on your own. All you need is that Metropolis Hastings algorithm is 10 lines of code, right? So it's pretty easy to get going. Um, I have some suggestions for further reading statistics. These are available in my slides and I think in my lecture notes as well. And uh, maybe I'm a little bit over time. Okay, not too much. I don't feel horrible. Um, I will stop sharing maybe. Um, take a look, or maybe even, should I hand it off to the uh, guys, you want to say something? Um, <laughs> okay, <Cool>. yes. So, <laughs> well, let me see if, I, I, I realize I didn't catch all the questions as they were going earlier. I skipped some, but I don't need to get to them now, but let me just see if there are any um Um, likelihood in each parameter. I'm not sure what you mean by degeneracy diagrams. You can, I mean, you have the full posterior, full probability in the n-dimensional space, Ricardo, and then you can you can look at the structure. So it's a very elongated thing in some direction. That means that means you have degeneracy. That means you can trade one parameter for the other. Um, there are more questions about degeneracy. What happened to the lip plot? So degeneracy just means that two things are very correlated. Imagine I measure A plus B, and I would like to know A and B. You can never learn A and B from just measuring A plus B. You need 
some more information. For example, you need your other friend to measure A minus B, and then you can break. So you have, and that's an infinite degeneracy. More, more often you get finite degeneracy when two things are just, you can trade them off one for another. Um, does MCMC guarantee a single mode likelihood? Oh, no, MCMC, you'll get uh, as arbitrary uh, a posterior or likelihood as, as the data wants. It could be multimodal. In cosmology, it's mostly unimodal. Not very often do you get multiple modes, not really that often. In neutrino oscillations, if you look at that field, if you look at the Feldman Cousins paper, they, there's that kind of famous multimodal horrible looking thing. But MCMC will give you different islands, you know, that does never very often, but it can give that to you. You have to kind of nudge it to be sensitive to those islands. But most of the time in cosmology, you don't see multimodal things. What would be the output of linear regression? Linear regression is just linear fit, but so it can give you a best fit of some theory, but it won't give you the error bars, right? You, that's kind of the thing when you go physics, go from, I don't know, high school to college or something and do some lab at some level, maybe in grad school, you'll realize that the error bar is actually more important than the measurement itself. It's all about the error bar, right? And so MCMC is essentially giving you the error bar. A regression in such things, you can get the best fit model, but it won't tell you what the error is around that. Um, and... Um, Right, if it magically multiple modes come in, then you say omega matter is a union of these two intervals. It's 0.3 plus minus 0.02 and 0.45 plus minus 0.01. You almost never see this in cosmology, but that's what you would do. MCMC output is not ellipse. It's a banana. It can be multimodal. It can be any... Uh, horrible thing, um, horrible looking thing, but it's a wonderful method. <laughs> um, any, yeah, if we are mixing apples and oranges in MCMC, uh, uh, first of all, you need, um, well, this, you, this is not a job for MCMC, Walter, when you have, say, apples and oranges. It's a job for your likelihood. So the likelihood level is when you encounter this. I have some measurements, O from weak lensing, O and have some measurements from CMB. O and my friend told me that Hubble concept is never greater than 80 because it cannot be. So how you combine all that information is your job for the likelihood. And that may be hard, especially if you're worried if your measurements are correlated. Right, But once you build a likelihood, you feed that thing into MCMC. So that's not a job for MCMC. It's really a likelihood question. And that could be hard combining you know, different data sets. Usually the question is, are they correlated? Uh, and yeah, so you can stick them in the same vector or no, but yeah. Yeah, so Andrea is asking about multimodality. So I'm not a huge uh, expert, but I do know Andrea basic way to get around multimodality. So Andrea is asking, he's saying that blob I had in the P1, P2 plane, you're walking around that and you're building it up, but there's another blob. There's another blob a little bit farther away. You'll never get to that other blob because you're separated by a value of low likelihood. So you'll never kind of, if you move in the direction of that blob, you'll be rejected because you'll go to low likelihood before you, you get. So the way to do that, Andrea, is to say the following. It's very kind of pedestrian. Every hundred steps or every thousand steps, make a big step, okay? Instead of make five times a step and just try to see if you'll end up in a, some land that's favored. Most of the time you'll get rejected, but once in a blue moon, you will actually land at that other island. Then you'll be walking at that other island. Then it's going to be one of those big steps that's going to return you to the first island. So put it, you by hand, you put in that make every, say, 100 step, make it big, just to see if you land somewhere else. Uh, so that's how you deal with that, Andrea. It, you can be done. Of course, there are cleverer ways about it, but this is one way that would in principle work. Uh, covariance matrix supernova is 500 by 500 and CMB really depends at which level you pixelize. Uh, so it, for Kobe, it was 8,000 by 8,000 or 6,000 or something like that. For WMAP, it was 100,000 by 100,000. For Planck, it's millions by millions. 
pixel pixel level covariance matrix. Yeah, there is a lot between different things. Uh, I would say as a word of wisdom for those of you, uh, well, a lot of things are good here, but if you ever, you know, touching data and this kind of thing, obviously being familiar with Gaussian chi-square distribution, but two things I highly recommend are Fisher matrix and especially MCMC. And if you want to write your MCMC from scratch, I recommend that. It will work. You just have to nudge it a little bit to work. And it's amazing to see that work. And um, so these are very highly recommended things. So even though my lecture is about largely structure, this, this stuff takes precedence in my view over some other aspect of lensing that I didn't get a chance to get to. All right, I'm, I'm not seeing more questions here. Maybe people are, have already exhausted the parameter space of questions for this class. <laughs> they did a Monte Carlo of questions around. <laughs> Unless somebody wants to make a big jump like Dragon just suggested and go to a different place in parameter space. We can, we can go with this analogy all night. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, anyway, all right. So people seem to be satisfied enough points in our parameter space. So I guess this is it. Well, Dragon, any last words or we can break for tomorrow? No, thank you, Raul, and thank you, everyone, for your attention. I know you're all a little tired. Uh, thank you all, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Have a, have a good rest. Yes, thanks a lot, Dragon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Rogério. Thanks, everybody. See you guys tomorrow. See you, guys. Thank you all. See you. Bye.